Hello everyone, welcome back to another quiz slash tutorial. I don't know what to call it yet, we'll figure it out along the way. For now I guess we'll stick with a tutorial quiz, something like that. But uh, today's quiz number five, and we're going to be talking about vector operations, and I put part two because really this quiz is more of a continuation of what we discussed in the last quiz, which are just some operations that we can do to vectors that return us with uh, specific things of interest for us. So if you've taken Edge 130 and you've taken Linear Algebra, then this should be review. should be nice and easy, a nice walk in the park. But don't worry, for those of you who want a challenge, this is kind of the end of the review. Moving on, we're going to get to basis. If you guys remember in the previous video, I, I, I kind of mentioned that basis are where things get a little challenging for students. And then we're going to get into some more uh, engineering aspects where you guys will begin to see how this applies to civil engineering. So before we begin the quiz, or I guess the quiz examples, whatever you want to call them, let's just take a little look at the theory we're going to be covering today. So let's consider two vectors in R3. We got x, which is composed of x1, x2, and x3, and we got y, which is composed of y1, y2, and y3. The first formula we're going to look at is the projection of x onto y. So it's a very simple formula. We got x dot y divided by the magnitude of y squared times the vector y. So kind of the thing to note about this is the thing in the brackets, if we look at that, x dot y is going to be a scalar. And the magnitude of y is also a scalar. So everything in that bracket will just return a scalar. And then we multiply it by the vector y to kind of retransform it into a vector. And I'm going to show you guys how this is proven in the example because it's actually a really easy proof and you guys will get to see exactly where this formula comes from. And if you guys are wondering what exactly this formula means, well, I kind of stole a slide out of my Eng130 notes that you guys may remember. But let's say that we have two vectors. And in Eng130 case, what we would usually have is we have a force vector f and a position vector r. And if we want to take the moment, we need the perpendicular distance. So what we do in a projection is we can find that perpendicular distance as well as a parallel distance by taking this projection. And we are able to get that little parameter there, that d with the perpendicular sign, because that's why we're interested in moments. Remember, we times it by the distance that goes 90 degrees into the force vector. So again, that's Eng 130. Don't worry about it too much. I'm going to explain it much better once we get into the examples. The second thing we're going to look at is the cross product. So it gets confusing since I stupidly used x instead of you know u or v or something. So if we have x cross y, basically what that's going to do is that's going to return us a vector. And these are going to be the three components of each of the each of the coordinates. So the first one's going to be x2 times y3 minus x3 times y2. And then we go on and so forth. And in the end, what this does is if we're crossing two vectors, we're basically getting a vector that's perpendicular to the plane that those two vectors create. So in this picture right here, again taken from Eng130 notes, if we have a and b as our two vectors that we're crossing, what we're going to have is we're going to return that value c, that vector c, and as you guys can kind of see from the picture, c is perpendicular to both a and b. So it's pretty straightforward. I'll explain it much better in the examples. I couldn't really find a good picture without, you know, getting uh, <laughs> smacked with the copyright strike or something like that. So uh, this is all I'm going to give you for now. So to explain it better, let's jump right into the examples. So this quiz is relatively short. We only have two examples. And the first one says, let x is equal to 1, 1, and s equal to 1, 0. Determine the orthogonal projection of s onto x. So this question is nice for you guys, because if you guys get this in exam, let's just straight up plugging in numbers into the formula, nice and easy. But the trick with this one is always the terminology. So it's very important to, to, <laughs> to identify what's being projected onto what. So in this case, I'm going to highlight it here. It wants the projection of s onto x. Now it's going to be very important because that influences what numbers we substitute into our formula. So if this is the case and we have s onto x, what this is, if we substitute in the formula, this will be the projection of x. So we have x at the bottom, sorry, projection of s onto x. So x goes on the bottom and s goes up here. So what I would do is into the midterm or the final, I'd bring a formula sheet and I would just show what vectors go into where. Because after this, it's pretty easy just to substitute the rest in the formula. So this is going to be equal to, and I'm going to put a bracket, x dot s divided by the magnitude, or I guess in this case, or in this course, the norm of x squared, and then all multiplied by x. So I, everything in this, actually, I'll put this here so you guys can see. So everything right here, this is going to just be a scalar right here. So this is a scalar, just a regular number. And then this x right here, 
this is going to be a vector we multiply the scalar by right there. So again, I told you, I explained it very, very poorly in the theory. So this is a better way to show you exactly what's happening. So basically we have kind of two things that are going on. We have a vector that we know is X and I'm gonna put this in a different color. So let's say that we have a vector right here, that's X, X right here. And then we also have a second vector coming up and this right here, this is going to be S. So what this formula gives us is it gives us the orthogonal projection of S onto X, and that's another vector, and I guess we'll do this one in yellow. So if I were to make a line that crosses the X vector perpendicular, so this is 90 degrees right here, what this projection is, is this is the vector of S that runs along the same direction as X. So this right here, this would be the projection of X on S. And the formula itself is pretty easy to prove. So I'll do it really quick. So if we know the angle theta between these two vectors, then basically all we can do is treat this as a right triangle because we have a 90 degree angle. We can do a nice right triangle. So we know that projection, projection of X S. So this is what we're looking for. Well, this is going to be equal to the magnitude of S. times cosine of theta. So this is just from trigonometry, because if I look up here, well, if this is S, then this length from here to here, that's going to be the magnitude, or I guess the norm of S. So see, even you guys know that in this course, I'm getting the terminology mixed up. So we go the magnitude of S times cosine of theta. So that's just treating it as a right triangle. We also know that cosine of theta is equal to the dot product divided by the magnitude of the two vectors. So now we got the magnitude of S right here. So that just comes from before. But then cosine theta, we can swap that out with X dot S divided by the magnitude of X and the magnitude of S. So like this. And then we can see here really quick that I can take my pink cancellation marker and I can cross the two S's. So just from this alone, what we end up with is the projection of x onto s is equal to x dot s divided by the magnitude of x. And then someone you're going to say, hey, Clayton, hold up one second. This formula that you have right here that you just highlighted, that's not the same as up here. And you're right, it's not. Because if we look at this formula right here and we look at what we did to the triangle, we treated everything as a scalar. The magnitude of s right here, that's a scalar. And then we're t and then the theta, that's just a triangle. So in the end, this projection of x on s, that's just the scalar of it. This is the scalar portion. So to make the scalar turn into a vector, we're going to have to times it by the direction of the, whatever we want the vector to be. So in this case, we want the direction of x. So to get that, what we do is we take x, the vector, and we divide it by x. So if you guys remember from edge 130, this right here is the unit vector. So this is the unit vector of x. Unit vector x. And we would put an edge 130 as u, I guess, x. And what that is, is that's the direction of x. So from this formula, we have the first part, which is kind of the scalar. And then we're multiplying it by the unit vector, which is the direction. And if we substitute everything in to this, what we find is we get the exact same formula as above because we've got x dot s divided by the norm of x squared because I just put those in any times by x. So it's exactly the same as we get from the formula above here. That's kind of the quick proof. You guys don't really need to know proofs. Don't worry about it. Unless you guys get into solid mechanics, then yes, Dr. Samer loves throwing proofs all over the midterm and finals. But for this case, you guys will be fine. So for this class, all you're expected to do is say, okay, here's the formula. And we have our values. So all we have to do is just input them in. So I'm going to come down here. I'm going to have the projection of xs is equal to, and the first thing that we're going to want is that dot product. So we're going to take the first component of x times by the first component of s. So we got 1 multiplied by 1. So I come down here and I go, okay, it's going to be 1 
times 1, and then plus, and we're going to do the second component times the second component. So in this case, we're going to have 1 times 0. So I come down here, and I go, okay, we got 1 times 0. And then at the bottom, we have the magnitude of x squared, or the norm. So remember, for the, the norm, what we do is we do that nice uh, formula with the square root. So it's going to be the first component squared times the second component squared. So again, I'm going to erase the s because in this case, we're looking at the magnitude or the norm of x. We're looking at these values right here. So the first and second component are both equal to 1. So what we're going to have right here is we're going to have 1 squared plus 1 squared. I'm going to put this over top like this. And I'm going to put this in brackets because this is the norm. But what we have is we have the norm squared. So this right here, everything in pink right here, which I'll put a giant bracket around. Ooh, that did not work out well. I'm going to put this in bracket right here because I want to make this clear that everything right here, this right here is just going to be a scalar. So I'm going to put brackets, scalar. And then we multiply that by the vector x. In this case, this is just 1, 1. So it's easy to go through here. And if we do the calculations, that scalar value, well, 1 times 1 is 1. So we're going to have 1 at the top plus 1 times 0. So that's 0. So at the very top, we're going to have 1. Uh, the bottom, we have, and I guess I should highlight this, we have 1 plus 1. So we got 2, the square root of 2. But then we square it, so we get 2. So in the end here, we get 2. And that's just doing mental math. What I'm going to hint to you guys, just use your calculator. That's the easy way to go. Don't be like me. Use your calculator. I get the worst mistakes. In uh, one of my exams, my 395 exam, I put that pi times pi is 2 pi. And I'll never forget it. And after that, I use a calculator for everything. 1 plus 3, I don't know. Throw in the calculator. That's what matters. So what we have here is we have 1 half times the vector x. So in the end, this is going to be 1 over 2, 1 over 2. And in the uh, quiz itself, it called this vector z. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put z is equal to, and then in this case, we just know it's going to be 1 half, comma, 1 half. Nice and easy. And again, I guess you, the multiple choice questions, can't, you can't really box your answer. <laughs> I guess you'll circle your answer in that case. But uh, it's always good to box your answer if you're ever doing a written exam. So that's the first question here. The second question, nice multiple choice question, and get used to multiple choice. The midterm and the final, all multiple choice. It can make life easy, but sometimes it can make it a living hell, <laughs> depending on uh, how close the answers are together. So for this one, it says, let u and v be vectors in R3. If the cross product of u and v is equal to the zero vector, then a, u is equal to zero, b, v is equal to zero, c, u is equal to alpha times v, where alpha is some scalar, and then d, any of the above. So there's kind of two ways of tackling this question. The first is thinking about the theory. Well, the theory kind of sucks. So what I'm going to hint to you guys is just substitute values into the formula. So if you guys remember the formula for the vector, it's going to be, and even I don't really remember, I'm going to have to think about it. It's going to be x2, y3, minus x3, y2. So this is going to be the first component, comma. And then I guess the next one would be x1, y3, minus x3, y1, and then comma. And then the last one, I guess, would be x1, y2, minus x2, y1. All right. So if I were to do uh, x, I guess this is going to look terrible, x cross y, this is what I'm going to get. So what I like to do in this question, because it's multiple choice, you don't have to show any work. You don't have to prove anything. Just substitute values. So if u is equal to 0, then this means that this is going to be 0, then this will be 0, then this will be 0, then this will be 0, and so on, crossing them all out. And if we look, every term in this equation is multiplied by 0. So if this is the case where I'm going to put x is equal to 0, 
But in this case, I'm doing, uh, let me just erase this, make it even easier. Let's go x is equal to 0. So if x is equal to 0, then yes, x cross y is going to equal to 0. So this one right here, this is an absolute check. Now, what I can do is I can erase this and say, OK, well, I just made all the x's equal to 0. What happens if I make all the y's equal to 0? So I'm just going to erase this for clarity. So instead, I'm going to go here, and I'm going to say, uh, let's do this in yellow. So now we got y is equal to 0. Well, if this is the case, then yes, this is equal to 0. This is going to be equal to 0. This will equal to 0. This will equal to 0, and then so on and so on. And yes, we can see that every term is multiplied by 0. So if y is equal to 0, then x cross y is equal to 0. So this one also gets a check mark. And if we look right here, well, we have two answers that are already correct. So if we're looking at this from a multiple choice perspective, it would have to be D, any, any of the above, right away, just because the first two answers work. Alrighty, guys, sorry for the weird cut. I was just going to tell you guys to play it simple, just circle D and move on. But since this is a video tutorial and I got nothing but time on my hands, let's explore option C really quick, which is x is equal to alpha times y, where alpha is any scalar value. Let's explore this one because this is actually a really interesting case. By the look of it, a lot of people would say, no, no way this can equal the zero vector, but let's find out. So to explore this one, all we're going to do is we're just going to explore the first term of the vector right here, you know, kind of keep it nice and easy to ourselves. And if we can prove it here, then it's actually easy to prove everywhere else. So we'll do this proof in pink. So originally, we have x2 times y3 minus x3 times y2. So this is directly taken from the formula above. But now we know, and I'll put this in a different color, we know that x2 is actually equal to alpha times y2. And then we also know that x3 is actually equal to alpha times y3. So what we're going to do, well, we're going to substitute those in. So instead of x2, we're going to have alpha y2, and now that's times by y3, minus alpha y3 times y2. So it's easy to see that basically... This right here is going to be a number, and on the other side, it's going to be a number, but they have the exact same components, alpha y2, y3. And on the other side, alpha y3, y2, but the order doesn't matter because we're multiplying them together. So in the end, yes, this will be equal to 0, and it's the exact same for every other component. So if I wanted to, I could have checked this, said yes, this is also correct. But remember, in an exam, go fast. So once you get A and B are proven, well, you just circle D, move on. I just thought, you know, I got the time. Might as well show you. So nice, easy quiz. Again, this should be the end of review. Get ready for uh, the next quiz when we talk about basis. Things start to change a lot uh, for the better, uh, most of it. But I guess that'll be up for you guys to decide. So thank you guys all so much for listening. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you guys in quiz number six.